I want you to turn in your Bible, if you would, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. I want to share a, a story with you that's found in the narrative of all the Gospels, really. Uh, they all agree on the same thing here. And uh, it's found in verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. Once you found that, would you stand with me in honor of and reverence to God's Word and remain standing also for prayer. Beginning in verse 38, the Bible says this, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. And heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much ser serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus said, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you this morning that we can stand here and we can teach and preach from your word. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to be able to come together as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and to be able to share from your word. Lord, it's no accident that we are here. You created us. You formed us. You know us. And so, God, you knew that we would need to be here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of the sin that is in my life. I realize today I stand here as a sinner, and I need forgiveness of my sin. Father, help us today as we study your word, as we preach your word. Help us to be receptive of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Leave your Bible open, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be going back to this passage here. Uh, but before we begin, I think it's very important that we really have a proper understanding of this narrative that we have in this uh, scripture today. I think we need to understand the big picture. We need to know exactly what's going on in our text. And so I want to spend a few moments just kind of unpacking that. And you may be familiar with this text, and that's okay. Uh, but we just want to look at it in its detail before we make some uh, practical applications here this morning. Jesus here is visiting a home of some of his friends in a little town called Bethany. And his friends included two women, a woman by the name of Mary and a woman by the name of Martha. They also had a brother. Their brother's name was Lazarus. And yes, this is the same Lazarus that Jesus himself had raised from the dead. Now, it's very clear in other gospel narratives as well that Martha and Mary and Lazarus would have been good friends of Jesus. And it was not uncommon for Jesus when he would be in the region to stop by on occasion and pay them a visit. And so they were good friends. And because of that, it brings us to a very special event that we are about to see take place in this passage today. Of course, we find that Jesus is visiting their home. Now, having guests in your home, just like today, is an important thing. We have the privilege today that they did not have, or we have the opportunity that they did not have. We have uh, doorbells that have cameras on them, and so if someone uh, comes up on our porch, whether it's a relative, a good friend, or a stranger, and they ring that doorbell, we can look on our cell phone, we see who it is, and we make a decision whether we want to answer the door or we want to pretend that we're not home. And uh, it doesn't matter who it is, we can make that decision. But they did not have that opportunity because many of their homes didn't even have doors on them. And so here we have uh, Jesus showing up for a visit. Now, uh, the rules of hospitality dictated a few things in that culture. And for us to understand fully this passage, uh, we need to understand what the rules of hospitality dictated at that time. First of all, you had to honor your guests. You had to receive them in. There was no turning them away. If they showed up at your front door, they would be there as long as the guest wanted to stay. Now, that should cause you to say, I couldn't imagine uh, somebody showing up and staying as, late, as long as they wanted to stay. Also, uh, the rules of hospitality dictated that they would either wash their feet or you would wash their feet for them. You would offer them a place to rest. You would prepare a meal for them. And here's the one final step in that. You would go around in your village and you would tell all of your family and all of your friends 
we have guests, we want you to come over, we'll meet you in the courtyard, and we're going to have a big party. Now, I want you to begin to paint that picture in your mind. Because this guest that showed up that day that happened to be Jesus did not show up alone. It may be one thing if Aunt Sally shows up for a weekend visit and that's all you have to deal with. But Jesus rolls into their home with 12 dirty men and he says, hey, I hope you don't mind, but we're going to spend some time here. Maybe even spend a couple weeks here, if not more than a couple days. Now, of course, this was just not any visitor. This was Jesus. So Mary and Martha would in no way turn Jesus and his friends away. They would have been thrilled, just like you would be thrilled if Jesus came to visit. In fact, maybe I should ask that question this morning. If Jesus showed up at your house this afternoon, are there things in your home that maybe you would have to get in order? Would you be happy with inviting him in and saying, sit down on my couch, let's turn on the TV? We'll watch the last thing that happened to be on the channel. Uh, Jesus, is it okay that you stay for a meal? Would you be willing and happy for Jesus to show up at your home? Well, there's a lot of things that's going on here in Martha's mind. Yes, she has a guest. But she has so much that needs to be done. Martha has to prepare food. She has to make sure they have a place to sleep. She has to make sure the guest rooms are available. She has to make sure that there's entertainment there. And can you see how this situation, as far as the ladies would see this, would be a hectic situation? Now again, just think of the logistics of this. One person showing up unannounced is one thing. But 13 people showing up unannounced, that's a whole another problem here. The biggest problem of all, though, has not been addressed yet. The biggest problem was compounded by the fact that her sister Mary was nowhere to be found. Here's Martha doing all these chores, getting all this ready, and, and Mary lived there, so Mary should have taken part in this. And so, no doubt, Martha goes out and she starts to look all over for her. Can you see her as she walks into the dining room thinking to herself, where is she at? She walks into the kitchen, where is she at? She goes out into the garden and then maybe to the barn. She checks all the guest room and does she find her sister? No, her sister's nowhere to be found. But then Martha goes into the courtyard of their home, which was a place where when company would come, they would all gather and they would socialize. And what she finds is Jesus is out there teaching, not just her family and her friends, but she finds Mary there sitting at the feet of Jesus on the front row listening to every single word that he's saying. Now she's a little bit infuriated by this and in fact she lost it. Wouldn't you? You're there to do all the work. Your sister is out uh, socializing with everyone that's there. And this was just too much for her to take. And so when we come to verse 40 we find in our text, and I want you to read this with me, where she actually comes up to Jesus, interrupts him in mid-sentence, and this is what she says, and follow along in verse 40. She says, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? And then she does something very, very strange. She instructs the Lord on what he needs to do. And she says, Lord, bid her, therefore, that she should help me. Now that is a nice King James way of saying, Jesus, she has lost her ever-loving mind, and if she thinks she's going to sit here in fellowship with you while I do all of this work, i got something to tell you it's not going to happen. Jesus, tell her she needs to get in the house and help me with some of this food. Now can you imagine a response like that? Let's just pause here in this narrative to, to give you an illustration of something. Because it's easy for us to fall into that martyr syndrome and start telling ourselves that we are the only one that's doing anything in the world. God, I'm the only one that does anything in the church and nobody ever says thank you. Lord, I'm the only one that's serving you the way that, I, that they should be and Lord, not one person has given me the recognition that I deserve. 
Ultimately, Lord, I don't even think you care. I don't think that you appreciate what I have been doing. None of us are above that martyr syndrome. None of us are above thinking that we have done so much and that people owe us so much. And really, do you know what that is? Folks, that's a heart condition. That's a true condition of your heart and why you're doing the things that you're actually doing. Now, when we feel this way, it's usually because our priorities are out of order. And if you don't like hearing about priorities, you're not going to like hearing this message at all today because that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Now, I want you to go back to this story, this narrative today. Martha was doing things that needed to be done. Did she need to cook and prepare food? Yes. Did she need to prepare the house? Absolutely. Did she need to prepare a place for them to rest? Without a doubt. It's not that she was wasting time. Get this. It's not that she was wasting her time on foolish things. She had the right idea. I mean, these things needed to be done. But Jesus gives her a response that probably just knocks her down, blows her away. Look at verse 41 of the text. Jesus says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Now hang on for a second, folks. I want you, you to see this. I find it very interesting that in this conversation that the gospel writer points out the fact that Jesus mentions her name twice. Now that's divinely inspired in Scripture. Not just that Jesus says her name. That's one thing. But Jesus actually says her name twice. And it's as though by saying Martha, Martha, it's a code for saying, you just don't get it, sister. You don't understand what's actually going on here. And you know what I have found in my life? When I start having that poor, pitiful martyrdom spirit that I can have sometimes. God, nobody appreciates me. Nobody really loves me. Nobody really wants me. Uh, people don't care if I would come or go. God, I'm not even sure you appreciate what I do for you. You know what the Holy Spirit says to me? Sean, Sean, you just don't get it. You don't understand. Oh, you're staying busy. It's not that you're not serving me, but your priorities. Just like the ladies in our text, at least one lady, was all mixed up. Jesus says Martha's name twice. I want you to underline that and look back at this at verse 41. Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. He says, I know what you're doing. And they're not bad, but look what he says in verse 42. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now Jesus is not saying, don't worry about getting the beds ready. Don't worry about the food. Don't worry about getting the house ready. He's not saying that. Jesus is saying, your sister's worried about that too, but she's worried about something far greater than that. Her priorities are right, and your priorities necessarily are not right. What was the one thing that her sister was concerned about? It was simply sitting at the feet of Jesus and spending time in his presence. Now, did you get that? Her sister was not doing anything wrong. But the priority at this time was sitting at the feet of Jesus and spending time in his presence. Now, I want to present a question to you as a congregation today. What does that look like to you as a Christian? Many of you would say, well, I love God. I serve God. I even serve in this church. And you know what Jesus could say to you? But your priorities are wrong. You've missed the most important priority, and that is spending time at the feet of Jesus, spending time with Jesus. Now, here's the lesson that I think we need to learn. I want you to jot this down because this is very important for us to understand. Here it is. Jesus wants to be loved before he wants to be served. Jesus wants you to love him before you serve him. 
Do you know what I have found to be true in, in ministry? That I can get so busy serving God and doing things for the church, and it's not that they're bad, but it consumes so much of my time that I haven't spent the time sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, while all of those things are good, there's nothing bad in that. In fact, you need to do that. He's saying there's one element in your life that's missing, and it should be the top priority, and that is spending time with Christ. You see, he wants your companionship before he wants your service. Now, this sounds totally off base, and you're probably wondering, am I in a Baptist church today? I've never heard a pastor say, God doesn't want you to serve him first. Well, that's what we beg people to do. That's what we encourage people to do. But do you realize if your relationship is right with God, the service is going to be there? And if there's an imbalance and there's all service and no relationship, then you're not right with God and you're just spinning your wheels and you're just serving and you're thinking you're doing good things. But at the end of the day, what Jesus is saying is, I want to have a relationship with you. That's the most important thing in your life. So this morning I want to spend a few minutes talking about how we nail this down in our life. What does this look like practically in our life as a Christian? Now in order to do this, there's three tests that you must take today. You will either pass these tests or you will fail these tests. But these tests will tell you exactly where you are in your relationship with God. Here's test number one. Jot this down. It's called the stress test. Do any of you know anything about stress? Has anybody ever been stressed? Have you ever been to the hospital and they told you we're going to give you a stress test? Why? That's a nice way of saying your life's really all messed up and we've got to make sure you're not going to die. That's what they're really saying. We want to make sure everything's in balance and we can give you the right medication because you're, you're a big ball of mess, a big ball of stress, and we've got to get that under control. Do you know what stress is in the life of a Christian? Stress is an indicator that your priorities are out of balance. You say, well, I can't live a life without stress. Oh, yes. If your priorities are balanced, you absolutely can. If you always feel overwhelmed and you always feel overloaded, it is a very good sign that you have some things on your plate that don't even belong there. It's not that they're bad. It's just that they're causing you stress that you don't need. It's just like these sisters. One was at the feet of Jesus. That was her priority. The other was so busy and stressed out that she missed that opportunity to actually worship her Lord. You know, Jesus never said in Scripture, I have come to give you turmoil. I have come to cause you heartache. I have come to give you endless frustration. No, what Jesus said is, I have come to give you peace. I have come so that, that your life can be made full. He was saying, uh, take my yoke upon you. But he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But in me, he is saying, you will find rest. Not in all the things you do for me. That's not where you find peace. You find peace actually in Christ. Now, folks, I'm probably preaching to the choir today, and I'm speaking from experience in two parts, in my life and in my ministry. And you may wonder, why do you always share illustrations about your life and your ministry? Because I know how messed up I am, and if I'm messed up, surely I'm not the only one in this church that happens to be messed up. And if it helps me, then certainly it must help you. But I, I know what it feels like to feel like I'm the only person in the kitchen that's working and everybody else is on vacation in the church. I know what that feels like. I know what that feels like in my life. I'm the only one doing anything, and everybody else is, is, is reaping the benefits, and everybody else is enjoying it. Do you know what happens when you become stressed as a Christian? Here's what happens. Satan lives in your mind. He distracts you, and he actually distorts reality. Satan will put things in your mind like, is that person upset with you? Does that person really like you? Does that person appreciate you? And he puts all these things in our mind, and you know what happens? We're so stressed out that it consumes our thought, and what we should be doing is prioritizing our time, and we need to start it out with being at the feet of Jesus and spending some time with Jesus because that's the number one priority 
And then many of those other things in life go away. Satan loves for us to feel stressed. Why? Because when we are stressed, we forget how blessed we are. Stress always pushes blessings away because the focus becomes stress. Our lady in our story today, was she stressed or was she blessed? Well, one was blessed because they were at the feet of Jesus. The other was stressed because she was so worried about serving Jesus. Not that it was wrong, but the timing was off. See, the problem is this. If you've got things on your plate that shouldn't be there, you're never going to get caught up. Yeah, the old saying is you're like a termite in a yo-yo. You've heard that before? I mean, things are never going to get better. You know, and you know what we generally do when we feel that way? The way out of that is, well, I'm going to serve God more. I'm going to be more devoted to Christ. I'm going to do more for him. I'm going to do more for the church. We have to have people that's willing to serve in the church. But first and foremost, we need people whose heart are right with God. Because at that point, then they're going to be able to serve Christ to the fullest. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about just having a busy day here and there. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about you as a Christian feeling like I'm always behind. I could never get caught up. I'm always stressed out. And as a result of that, it's caused you to get your focus off of Christ. I don't have to tell you if that's how you feel. You already know if that's how you feel. You know if your number one priority is Christ. And just because you are here today does not mean... I don't want to drink sanitizer. I know that. That would be bad for all of us. <laughs> your number one priority today should be Christ. It shouldn't be your service. It shouldn't be the things that we're doing. So I'm talking about someone that always has this attitude that I need to do more for the Lord, but they never feel adequate. And as a result of that, Jesus is saying to you, listen, you're so stressed out, you're no good to me at all. So ask yourself a couple questions here this morning. Ask this question. What is in my life that needs to go? Well, that answer is simple. What is distracting me from spending quality time with Christ? What is it in my life that needs to change? What is it in my life that needs to stop? And by the way, maybe you are the thing that needs to change. It brings me to the second test that we want to talk about today. Probably most of us fail the old spiritual stress test. But number two, there's the priority test. Now, isn't that what we've been talking about all along? What our priorities are? Well, go back to verse 41 of our text. I want you to see this actually in the text. Jesus says, Martha, Martha. Thou art careful and troubled about many things. And then in verse 42, but one thing is needful. He's saying there's one thing you're lacking, there's one thing that you're leaving out, and because of that, your entire existence, your entire life seems like it's not flowing the way that it should. You know what Jesus is asking her? Jesus is really saying, Martha, what is your priority? What's your priority here? What's the most important thing for you? And in fact, Jesus says it in a very gentle way. But he's saying, Martha, can you answer this question to me? What is it that matters most in your life? Is it having the perfect table set? Or is it just spending some quality time with me? Listen, if you don't determine what is a priority in your Christian life, Satan will determine that for you. Did everybody get that? If you do not determine... What and who is going to be a priority in your Christian life, Satan will fill in that schedule for you. And by the way, it's easy for us as Christians to justify the priorities in our life. And we'll say this is more important than this when really it's not. Reminds me of a group of four men that decided they were going to go deer hunting one day. And so they decided to break up in groups of twos and they went their own way. And at night they came back together and here comes Harry. He's uh, walking in and he's dragging this eight point buck behind him and the other two friends they said Harry where's Larry and he said well Harry uh, Larry's about a mile back in the woods and said he had some kind of stroke or something and he fell over and so he said he's still back there and they said you mean you brought the buck here and left Larry there and he said well I didn't figure anybody would try to steal Larry <laughs> see where the priorities are a little mixed up 
You can justify that. On the surface, sounds pretty good. It makes sense. But once you really think about it, the priorities are just a little bit out of place. We've got a lot of Larrys in here today. We've got folks that can make a good excuse for why their priorities are the way that they are. But Jesus would say to you, you're not spending the time you need at my feet. You're not spending the quality time you need with me. Not that anything you're doing is bad, but I'm not first in your life. I'm not the number one priority. So we have that stress test. We have that priority test. This brings us to the third and final test this morning, and that is the reward test. The reward test. Go back to verse 42 in the text and listen to what Jesus says. He says, Mary hath chosen the good part, and then underline this, which shall not be taken away from her. Do you know how to determine what your priorities should be in life? What does that look like? What does that process, uh, what, what's it actually like for a Christian? Well, my friend, you base it on what's going to last the longest, what's going to have the biggest payoff. That's how you determine what's going to be the most important thing. Recently, a friend of mine had told me the story that he came home from work one day, and he said he pulled in the garage, and he was walking through the laundry room, and as he's walking through the laundry room, he said, Clothes were just piled everywhere. And obviously, he said, my first thought was, what has my wife been doing all day? Well, I've been at work. The laundry's not done. And, and he came up in a home where he said when his dad would come home at night, his mom would have every single thing done. The table was set. And I mean, it was all taken care of. And so he said this is kind of where his background came from. But he goes through and all kinds of clothes in the laundry room. He says he turns the corner into his fear. He said there's dishes piled up in the sink. And he's thinking, what is going on? What has this woman been doing all day? And so he rounds the corner and he says he sees his wife in there with their four-year-old. And she says, oh, honey, I'm sorry. She said, I know the cushions are all off of the couch. And uh, she said, we've been building a fort today. And uh, we played a football game here in the kitchen. And she said, I didn't have time to do all of that because I wanted to invest this time in our son. And he wanted to play so bad, just wanted to play football. He's so excited about it. And so we built a fort and then we... We, uh, we played football here in the family room, and the husband said the Holy Spirit made it very real to him at that very moment that he was so thankful that he had a wife that could think long term. And the most important thing that she could do at that moment was spend time with her son, who would remember that probably for the rest of his life, and those other things were secondary. Now, ladies... Just as a disclaimer for all the men that are here today, that doesn't mean you don't have to do the laundry. And it does not mean that you don't have to do the dishes. It, it's about priorities. There comes a time where, yes, it has to be done. And don't any of you ladies go home and try to use that. And a week from now, you come back and the house is dirty, the dishes aren't done, and all that stuff. And say, well, the pastor said we should spend more time with the kids. And that's what I did every day, just investing in their little lives. So let me know how that goes over for you. But I think you get the point that I'm making here today. There's a time and there's a place for everything. There's some things that can wait. But there's some things that cannot wait. Friend, if your priorities are out of balance, your life is out of balance. And if your life is out of balance, you're stressed. If your life is out of balance, spiritually, you feel empty. If your life is out of balance, it's not that you're not serving God. You're just not making Christ the priority in your life. I want to close with this. I came across some interesting statistics. Someone had calculated the, the, the typical lifespan of someone that lives to be 70 years old. How much actual time, 24 hours in a day, that they would spend in doing these things in their life. And this may not be true across the board, but it put things in perspective. It said the average Christian sleeps 23 years of their life. They work 16 years of their life. They watch TV eight years of their life. They eat six years of their life. They spend time in their vehicles traveling six years of their life. They spend time doing leisure activities four years of their life. They are ill about four years of their life. They spend two years just getting dressed. Two years of your life you spend 
putting on your clothes. And men, if that describes any of you, then shame on you. Let me just say that. <laughs> but the one thing that stood out to me was this. The average Christian that lives to be 70 years old spends less than one year of their life attending church, praying, and having intimacy with God. Now, does that not seem out of balance? Can you see where everything else is a priority? And it's not that they're bad. They're good things. You agree eating's good? Eating's good? Yes. Breathing's good. Watching TV sometimes is good. Working is good. But when Christ is not the first and foremost in our life, everything else is out of balance. Now, Jesus teaches us in Scripture where early in the morning he would get up and pray. And I'm going to tell you, I struggle with that. But I think the reason Jesus did that is because that was the most important part of his day. And if he could get that right, then everything else was secondary to that. And it changes your attitude. It changes your outlook on life. It changes the decisions that you make. If that one element is missing, and do you know how easy it is for us as Christians to miss out on those things? Because we are Christians, because we do come to church faithfully, it's real easy for our time with God to elapse and to push that off and look back and say, I've not been spending any quality time. I mean quality time, like Mary at the feet of Jesus. Are you so busy serving today that you have forgotten what it means to love? The title of this message today is simply this, Love First, Serve Second. Let's make Christ loving Him a priority again in our life. Will you do that this morning? Let's stand together. Lord, we thank you today that you have given us this opportunity. Lord, I think we could call it a privilege. Father, I would ask today that you would help all of us to search our own hearts, our lives. And Lord, there is no doubt that in this room we have many, many faithful, good Christian people that others would look at and they would say they're so faithful in their service and they're faithful in the time that they give to the Lord, but God, maybe you would look at our lives and you would say, there's one area that's lacking. I'm not a priority in their life. In spending personal time with me, Lord, help us to get things in balance. Help us to make our personal time with you a priority. Lord, help us to stop making excuses about why we're doing all the things that we're doing and realize that, as the Apostle James said, life is a vapor. It's here for a short time and then it's gone. Lord, I don't want to stand before you and hear you say, you did so many wonderful works for me, but one area you lacked, and that was just spending some personal time with me. God, help us all. No matter how long we've been a child of God, help us all to search our heart and our life today. Help us today to make a commitment. Lord, to spend more time with you, personal time, intimate time with you. Lord, help us to get our life back in balance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.